celebrating the power of possibility. My name is Mark Dean, and I believe anything is possible. Welcome to Anything is Possible. My name is Halloran Hilton Hill. These are great stories about great people whose lives prove that anything is possible. And straight out of Jefferson County, <laughs> Dr. Mark Dean, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. It's an honor. You know, when I first heard about you, I hear about you in association to the personal computer and all the work that you did at IBM and the work that you did at the University of Tennessee. But I would love to know who made you. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. And, and, and prior to us starting this conversation, you were talking about your grandfather and your father, mm -hmm. your parents. I would love to start there. Okay. Because your journey has taken you around the world from Jefferson County. Yeah, that's true. Tell me about who made you. Who made me? Well, I was fortunate. I lived in a small town, Jefferson City, that uh, my parents uh, were there and my grandparents were there and my great-grandmother was also in the same little town. We actually lived on the hill. So this was on the what I would call the black side of town, uh, on the other sides of the railroad tracks, obviously. And, but growing up, I didn't know any better. That was, that was fine with me. And my parents uh, taught me a lot. My grandfather was a history teacher. He's, he was also the... Uh, principal of the black school at the time, wow. of course, and that's how where I started. I'm, I was in the first and second grade in the before integration, and so I went to the black school. And my grandfather was the principal there, and he taught me a lot about history. Uh, he 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 really made a strong impression on me. You know, he said people aren't born bigots. They, they're born just like everybody's born in bigotry and a lot of things are things you learn. It's not something that you're born with and it's something you can unlearn. And so sometimes you just have to expose people to the other thought around how humans are and, and how equal we are. And they oftentimes will move. And, and so he taught me a lot about having that conversation, not being afraid to have that conversation and it, it, about a lot of things so that people can understand that. My father was a tinkerer. He loved building stuff. He built a tractor from scratch. He built an amplifier. He, he built his own stereo system. I mean, he, he was a tinkerer. And that's how I got into to building things. Um, I, when, when I went to school in the black school, four grades were together. First through fourth grade was together. And I actually started before uh, I was six years old because of my grandfather. And I was good at math. I was really good at math. And one of the things the teacher allowed me to do is to do all the math I could do. So I was doing fourth grade math in the first grade. I was actually tutoring the fourth graders wow. uh, in, the, in the first grade. And I brought home an, uh, a book. It was a trigonometry book or a geometry book. And my mother called the teacher and said, well, this book is too advanced for my son. He's, you know, he's, he's just in the first grade. She said, no, nope, he's already doing this, this work in class. He's teaching you know, the students uh, about this. So that kind of pointed me. Now, I couldn't read worth a darn, and I, and I still challenge. My wife will tell you I'm still challenges. But numbers, I could do numbers. And so my grandfather, my parents, uh, my great-grandmother said, yeah, you should consider being an engineer. Nobody in the family had been an engineer. Uh, my father worked at TVA, so he would expose me to that part of it. But I learned I wanted to do computers. It, I think what's interesting about your story is twofold. One, your grandfather kind of freeing you from the limitation of believing that all people won't like some people. Right. Just him giving you that opening to go, yeah, you may see me this way now, but we can, we can negotiate a different arrangement here. That, that's huge to me. But then the other part, Doc, is permission to tinker. Yeah. My, my dad had a workbench in the, in, the, 
in the basement of our house when I was growing up, and he was always fixing something or making something. And it wasn't until you started talking about your father being a tinkerer that it, sh it strikes me that when you are in the wake of creativity, it gives you permission mm -hmm. to create. And I wonder yeah. what that did to you and what that yeah. did for you, just being exposed to that energy. Well, it taught me that you can't be afraid. You have to try. If you say, oh, I, if you start out saying, oh, I can't do that, I don't understand, well, that might be true, you don't understand, but it doesn't mean you can't do it. You've got to not be afraid and get in there and take something apart. Not be afraid that, oh, I might not be able to put this back together, but that's okay. You're gonna learn something along the way. If you're not making mistakes, you're, you're just sitting still, right? And so that's my, my father, he, he always taught me that it's a learning experience, right? He didn't know how to build a tractor from scratch, <laughs> but that didn't stop him from trying, and he, he turned out to be successful. He made a lot of mistakes along the way. Okay, that's fine. You, you learn something from that, and I learned, obviously, being around him, uh, that, yeah, anything's possible. And that, my grandfather taught me that as well, is anything is possible. And in fact, I grew up thinking that achievement was expected. Wow, let's, let's pause right there because that's a huge seed for, for a young person. My guest is Dr. Mark Dean. He had a lot to do with the personal computer. You'll hear about that. This is Anything Is Possible. Possibility powered by Pilot Flying J, Covenant Health, Home Federal, and the Knoxville News Sentinel. Coming up, for my master's degree, I built a graphics workstation. That base became one of the first IBM PCs. I'm so fascinated and excited to have uh, you with me, Dr. Dr. Mark Dean. We were talking about the fact that uh, it was expected that you would do great things. Isn't it amazing how little kids don't know what they can't do until you tell them? That is, it is amazing, but until they're exposed to what's possible, they don't know. I mean, I was fortunate, I was exposed and pushed to be something, you know, whatever I wanted to be, basically. And had, I was told I had no limits, I could do whatever I wanted to do. But most kids aren't told that. I mean, they're, they're not exposed to the possibility of engineering or math. How, how did your parents get to feeding that thought in a segregated America, yeah. in the South. Mm -hmm. How did they get to that belief in that possibility? Or, or they say fake it till you make it. Were they selling you on something that they weren't sure was true, but they wanted it to be true and didn't want to put a speed bump in your way? Oh, no. I, they would say that it, can't, it will only be true if you make it true. Right, that's, I think that's one of the things I learned. Something is not truth until you work to make it truth. Because people will believe it's not true until you prove it can be true. Mm. And so they always said, you have to prove that you can get there. I know you can get there. Many people will try to block you and not believe you can get there, but you have to believe in yourself that yes, you will be able to to achieve, you are capable of doing whatever you know you would love to do, and so I was always positive. And maybe to my fault is I'm a little overconfident sometimes. So I I may be afraid, but it never stops me. Right, you go for it. I I will always go for it. In fact, the more afraid I am, that means the more I'm going to have to go after it because I got to get past this fear, and maybe that keeps me on uh, a little alert and and aware. Maybe, maybe that's important, but I never let fear or concern or, or not knowing stop me from trying. Sounds like you're afraid of fear, like you want to conquer fear because of... Maybe, maybe <laughs> there's a little bit of that. I, I, all I know is that if I tell people I mentor as they're going through the career, their career, if they never take a job that scares them to death, they're not moving fast enough. And I always said that if I take a job and I'm scared to death that I don't know what I'm going to do or how I'm going to make it work, I've just made the right step. 
because I'll figure it out. You have to have confidence that you'll figure it out, and you can gain access to people to help you figure it out. But if I'm not afraid of that next position and what, whether I'm going to be successful or not, I haven't taken a big enough step. And, that, and so that's, I always go for those jobs that scare me to death. I have no clue, but those, those are the jobs you got to take. I know you get it. But do you get how much they deposited in you by giving you that kind of faith? Like, dad builds a tractor, he takes stuff apart, he tries stuff. Failure wasn't fatal in your family. No. It was just learning. It was just, it was just learning. Do you know what a gift that is? Well, can you imagine my grandfather, when they integrated the schools, he was principal at the black school. He became a history teacher at the integrated school. It was one of only the one or two black teachers that were in the school. That's got to be, he had to be scared to death, I would think. He didn't show it, and he didn't let that get in his way. He went on and, and made it happen, and obviously his leadership made it possible for a lot, all the blacks to integrate and, and have at least a chance to be successful. But before we move on in, in, in our interview, would you call their name? Eugene Peck is my grandfather. Eugene E. Peck is the way we would say it. Um, my grandmother was Ophelia Peck. She was uh, obviously great to me. My father's James E. Dean, and my mother is um, Barbara Peck Dean. And you said there was a generation before your great? My great-grandmother, I called her Mammy. Her name was Leola Bassett. But, uh, but she was known by just about everybody, by Mammy. Now, I, I was fortunate. I was the first great-grandchild and first grandchild. So I got to name all of you everybody. Got, yeah. <laughs> so my grandfather was named Papu, because I couldn't say Papa. I said Papu. And my grandmother was named Mamu, because I couldn't say Mamma. So, so those were my names that I had given. And Mammy was my great-grandmother. So I gave uh, all of my grands their names, and all of the following kids had to hold to that, so. Awesome. All right, so now let's start to dive into your, your story story, or at least the one that is told about your life in technology. So you attend the University of Tennessee? I attended the University of Tennessee, yeah, undergraduate in electrical engineering. So you finished that degree, and then what? Well, I was... Uh, Ever since I was in the ninth grade, I wanted to work for IBM. For, I, just, I knew I wanted to do computers, and IBM was it at that time. This is back in the early 70s. And so I was fortunate. I kept my grades up when I was in college. Um, so I was, you know, I was a prospect. And uh, one of my professors had a recruiter and had a, one of his students was, had come from IBM to recruit. And he says, you really should talk to this Mark Dean fellow. He's pretty good. And so I got an interview. And um, yeah, they said, why don't you come down to Boca Raton, Florida, and, and see if you like it. So I had interviewed with Hewlett Packard and actually Chrysler and some other people. But you know, when you go down to Florida and, and you get to work for a company that's the top in uh, computing, uh, I said, sure, of course, you know, <laughs> why not? And I saw the lab I'd get to work in, and I didn't tell them this, but I, I would have been there. If, if they had just given me a place to live and fed me, I was good to go. I, they didn't have to pay me. I was, I was in heaven. I mean, this was heaven. All the equipment and all the parts, and I could, I could build anything. Right? And so, so I said yes, and I ended up in Boca Raton, Florida. So... You go to Boca Raton, you're in paradise, yeah. and you start working. Do you have any idea what your trajectory would be from that launch pad? Um, I didn't know the trajectory, but I have to say I had a set of goals. And I had mapped out a 35-year career from that beginning. I knew. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, wait, a minute, wait, wait a crazy. minute. That's wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. This is the. Uh, now I'm just. You, you just turned me up to 10, <laughs> right? Wait a minute. So, how old are you at this point? 22. 
So you're 22 years old and you have a 35 year career plan. I did. Why don't we take a break right here? <laughs> I think I had a 10 year, but not a 35 year plan. I can't wait to hear what that plan was and how your life either matched or exceeded that plan. My guest is Dr. Mark Dean. More in a moment on Anything is Possible. When we left off, he was in Boca Raton in a dream uh, lab, and uh, he knew that he had a plan. How did you get to 30, then first of all, the number 35, and what was the plan? Well, I had goals, and I, and I tell people it's important for you to set goals, so you know where you are and know where you want to be at any given time. And the reason that I did that is so that opportunities only appear in a small moment in time. And if you know what you want and you know where you want to be, you can make a decision fairly quick. And it's amazing if you, most people, if they think back at the times where they've made decisions that changed their lives, they didn't know it was going to change their lives, but they were able to make decisions in that moment. It's, it's amazing because how many, how infrequently you get those moments in times where you make a decision within a small amount of time and it changes your life. So I felt I need to be prepared. So that's why I set up some goals. So I knew I wanted to get my master's degree within so many years of starting IBM. I knew I wanted to be an IBM fellow within so many years from when I started. Actually, I wanted to be the youngest IBM fellow at the time. I knew if I would made it, I was going to be the first black IBM fellow at the time. So that was in my plan. I knew I wanted to get my PhD because eventually, after I retired from IBM, I wanted to teach at a university, so that was important. I also wanted to be in IBM research, so I had to get my PhD, but I had to get my PhD within 10 years of when I started with IBM, or I, was, I wouldn't have done it. So I had a time limit there. I knew I wanted to lead IBM research. I knew that when I wanted to actually retire from IBM, I knew when I wanted to start my academic career. And so, yeah, I had, uh, I had a lot of I had a lot of plans, and but I also had outs, so I had I had escape plans as well. This sounds like engineering. <laughs> it's, it's, maybe it's a, and maybe it's a little too structured, uh, and I but I never let any of my goals be uh, kind of drop dead goals. Meaning, if I didn't achieve them, I lost. I they were just mileposts, and if you got there, good. If you were a little bit behind, but you were still in the right trajectory, cool, just you keep going. If something changed your life and you had to move past that trajectory, okay, then set up a new set of mileposts. But it, it, it helped me. Now, it's, you could argue it's a little extreme to kind of map out 30 something years of career. Uh, most people wouldn't do that, um, but for me, it really, it helped me know where I was and helped me know where I wanted to be. To have a 30 year or 35 year plan, to have these milestones, first you have to believe that it's possible to meet those milestones. Mm -hmm. This is why I keep going back to the pecs, mm -hmm. right? That seed of this thing we do, anything is possible. That seed, because how does a, 22-year-old young African-American male in the computer industry before there was a computer industry, mm -hmm. how do you even, how do you even, if you don't have that, that germ or that seed of faith, right. just that, That's right, right kind of sets you free. So you get down to uh, Florida, IBM, with your 35-year plan, and you're off to the races. So what, what do you do? Well, I have fun. It's, it's the first thing. I have a lot of fun. I mean, it was like, really? Those first 10 years, that was just marvelous. Um, I, those, have been, those were the best years from my career standpoint. So like I said, I was in a lab. I had all this stuff around me. And I could build anything. So for my master's degree, I built a graphics workstation. That base became one of the first IBM PCs, IBM PC-AT, actually. So 
that just experience, and I learned a lot. I learned a lot from the people around me. And I have to say, you know, these achievements weren't made um, by myself. I mean, there's, there was a lot of people involved, a lot of key people that involved in helping and, and I learned from and being a part of the, of the work itself. A lot of my patents are in conjunction with other people. But um, I was, yeah, I, I thought, gosh, if I can build this, I didn't, when I was building something or designing something, I didn't necessarily say, oh, this is gonna change the world. I said, this, this has solved some problems that people have, it's interesting, and maybe it'll uh, come to something. If it doesn't, I learned a lot while I was doing it, I'll use that for the next one. And I think that, uh, that helped me in achievement. When, when the executives wanted a new system, uh, I was in the meeting and I said, oh, well, I happen to just have, I just have finished this design. It, it's close to what you want. I can make some tweaks. I think it'll do exactly what you need. They said, really? Okay. All right, you got it. And that's where the PCAT came from. That's where this ISA bus, which ended up being the industry standard for about 15 years, came from was a project I had as a master's student. And, it turned into something that uh, everybody ended up wanting. So I want to I want to dive into that part of the story. This uh, PCAT and the IS A bus. ISA bus. Yeah. Uh, I want to learn from you today, and we'll learn more in part two. Uh, this is my guest, Mark Dean. More next time.